All right, the first thing I want to do is mention is not to confuse you. I've got the my old version of the book up here. In the old version of the book, this was chapter 6. In your book, it's chapter 3. It's pretty much the same thing, but at least this will give me a focal point as opposed to just lecturing and saying, now turn to this page. So the pages that I have won't be the same as the pages you have. Does that make sense? They won't be, and, and the content may not be identical, but it's, it'll be very, very, very similar. The hope is today is to get through all of Chapter 3, which in your book starts on page 129. All right. We did this program the other day. We did a program as a class, so if you weren't here, you're going to have to watch the tape because we did an employee class program, which was number one. We did that as a class. You will be required to turn that in, and no, I did not save a copy. All right, not at least not that you can have. You have to put it in. All right, so if you did miss class, you're going to have to watch that tape. It should be out there. If it's not, then you're going to have to let me know. But I, as far as I know, it's out there. I, I don't know. We'll, 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 we'll go over that by the end of class, though. But again, most of the stuff that's in here is the same as, as, uh, as what you have in your book. There, it's a little bit different, but most of it's the same. Okay? So I don't want to sit here and give you a big, long shtick on objects and classes. So I'll try to give you a short shtick on objects and classes. And some of this you may have heard the other day. All right? So again, and I may have even used the same type of an analogy, but I'm going to say it again especially for those who were not here the other day. And that is, imagine that you buy a tract of land. And that tract of land, okay, that you buy has got 200 acres on it. And you decide on those 200 acres, you're going to put a house on each acre. Everybody with me? So literally, 200 acres, you're going to put 200 houses on there. So what you do is you, you bring in an architect, and the architect comes up with five different house plans. So you're going to literally lay it out where house one, house two, house three, house four, house five. And then another row of house one, house two, house three, house four, house five. You're going to do that 40 times. Does all that make sense? Each one of those house plans that you have, not the houses, but the plans, are called a class. They're a blueprint from which you're going to create house objects. All right? An object-oriented programming language like Java is, and so is C Sharp, just so you know says that you literally create objects from classes. There are built-in classes already for you to use in Java, and you can create your own. What we did in class, no pun intended, but what we did in class the other day is we created an employee class ourselves. All right, we gave it some capabilities. Okay, so an object, as it says, ideally an object, it's an instance of a class, but it serves a purpose. So if I was going to be, be creating a class that was going to, you know, literally that was going to be talking about people, I would have class person. And I might make a Jessica object, and a Luke object, and a Ben object, and a John object, etc. All of those objects that I make would have the same properties, so this, the same things, maybe a height and a weight, etc., and the same behaviors. They could eat, they could drink, they could sleep. The properties, the, the settings for those properties would be different from each one. Just looking at them right here, it looks to me at least like Ben is taller than Luke. So if I did a height property, they would be different. They would both have a height, but it would be different. All right? So an object is a software component that exists in memory and, and serves a purpose. It's created from a class. In fact, sometimes you'll see in books... The, uh, the act of, co of creating an object from a class is called instancing or instantiation. All right, you'll see those terms. Objects store data. The data is either referred to as, as fields or attributes or properties or data. Depends on the book you read and the author. An object can perform operations. Typically, those operations are called methods. Some books, they still call them behaviors. I'm not sure why, but they do. All right. Again, Java has built-in objects, 
and you can create your own objects. Okay? So they show you something that's really not all that different from what I mentioned to you here on page. It looks like 130 or, or 131 or something like that with the houses that are in here. Again, I don't want to go through that because I think I just did. All right? So if you turn up in your book to the next page, to page 132 in your book, and I'm hoping the heck, like heck, it still pretty much is in, gate, in step here. Okay, he doesn't have that. think this I'm back here all right what we're going to do is we're going to go over the stuff that's in your book building a simple class step by step which starts on page 132 and pretty much it's the rest of the of the chapter all right but to do that I was just talking to one of the first year students Anthony in the last class and he, he just came up and he said you know I appreciate it when you go through an example like this and run through it, it makes more sense than just reading it in the book so what I'm going to do is pretty much build what they show in the book, but I'm going to go in myself. I'm going to go in here into Eclipse, and I've got to watch it because I've got so much junk here that pretty soon Eclipse isn't going to run. You only have a certain amount of disk space on your virtual desktop. If you keep throwing stuff out there and throwing stuff out there and throwing stuff, pretty soon stuff stops working. All right. Now, in your book on 131, they mention that they're going to create a simple class that's called Rectangle. All right. The rectangle class is going to have two pieces of data in it, a height and a width, or I'm sorry, a length and a width. And it'll have methods, set length and width, get length and width, and get area. All right. So I'm going to come in here. You don't have to do this because I'm going to be kind of buzzing through this quickly. So I'm going to come in here and create a brand new thing. I'll put this, what I create in here, I'll put it out there on the system when I finish. So I'm going to create a, a project called Rectangle. Create the package. I'm going to create the class that's also going to be called rectangle. And for now, I won't put a main in it. Okay, so there it is. Now I'm it won't. I'm not going to comment it or anything else because I'm more concerned with us getting through as much of this as we can today. Ideally, we'll finish the chapter today then both classes next week will be lab. So if you're in both classes, they'll be lab for both. That's what I'm shooting for. We'll see how it works. So the first thing I want is I want to put in a height, or I'm sorry, a length and a width. All right. You'll notice I'm not giving them values. We'll do that later. All right. Now, also in your book, again, on 132, it says we want a set length, a set width, a get length, a get width, and a get area. Well, that means I'm also going to eventually at least, at least maybe need an area, but I'm not going to put that in now. Instead, I'm going to come up, and I showed you this the other day. I'm going to click Source, Generate Getters and Setters, and I want all of them generated for me. So now what I've done is I typed in these two lines of code right here, and I had the system type in the other stuff for me. So now I now have, out of what it says I want in the book, I've got my length, I've got my width right here, I've got my set length and get length here, and my get width and set width or whatever here. So the only thing I'm missing according to this is the area. Okay? So, I don't know how that got screwed up like that, but it did. So I like to put a little white space in here just because it makes it easier to read. You may or may not agree with that. So I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to put in public int uh, yeah, get area. All right. And I'm just going to say here, return length times width. Don't worry about that right now. If it looks funky or whatever, we'll get to that later. All right. 
So what they show you, what the author shows you in the book on page 133, we used to teach classes here in something known as systems analysis and design. In fact, if you have been coming to the school for several years, you may have even taken the class with me or with someone else. But the reason I'm telling you that is if you look at your figures 3, 4, and 3, 5 that are on page 133, they're showing you what a UML or a unified modeling language diagram looks like. You create a rectangle, you separate it into thirds. The top third, you put the name of your class. The middle third, you put in the name of your data items. And the bottom third, you put in the name of your methods. So why am I take, taking the time to tell you about that? Because if you're willing to pay good enough money, you can buy tools that will either take your UML and turn it into code for you, or will take your code and turn it into UML for you. It doesn't write everything, but it starts writing some stuff for you. All right, so you can see the stuff that's in there. All right, then at the bottom of the page, they talk about access specifier. And if you turn in your book, and again, I'm not sure if I'll have it here or not, but if you turn in your book and you look on page 134, you'll notice that they have in there, and again, I'm just trying to catch up here. There's a chart, this one here, it's 3-1, but it's 6-1 on my screen. Private and public. Now, I'm going to give you a general statement, which means it holds true most of the time. What most of object-oriented programming is about, most of it, is about using public methods to manipulate private data. That's object-oriented programming in a nutshell. All right, using public methods to manipulate private data. That said, it is legal to have public data. You hardly ever do it. It is legal to have private methods. All right, and we'll talk about that later. In addition, and not shown on this thing, and not shown in your book on page 134, there's a thing in the middle that's called protected. We'll get to that in a, in, in a later chapter. So I'm not going to talk about it right now. All right. Now, good, bad, or indifferent by me creating that set length method for you, which is shown on the top of 135 in the book. Oops. All right. Come on. So this is the set length method, and it doesn't look like it does very much. This is the same thing you see in your book on page 135. So let's go back to the code. All right. So this is the set length method. And I, what I want to do is I'm going to highlight both of these, and I want to compare and contrast the difference between what's called a getter and what's called a setter. All right. First, we talk about the set method, because that's what they show in here first. When you have a set method, virtually, virtually 100% of the time, it doesn't return anything. So the return type is void, as you see right here. Almost always, when you create a set method, you pass something in. So that's the parameter there. Now, look at that as opposed to the get. Whereas with a set, it doesn't return anything. A set returns something. Whereas with a set, you pass something in. Usually with a get, you pass nothing in. The sets are called mutators. So because you've got the name of a variable, one of your variables up here on the left-hand side of an equal sign. The gets are called accessors because you're not, you don't have any equal sign. You're just returning something. So again, I, the example I gave you the other day, it's like if I meet, meet Jessica for the first time and I say, hello, what's your name? And she says, Jessica. That's a get. All right. And I used the, the, the example with Eric the other day. If I did it with Eric and I said, oh, you're, from now on, you're called this. And if I had the ability to change his name, all right, then that would be a set. So when you're mutating, you're changing something when you're doing it with a set. When you're doing a get, you're accessing, so you're not changing anything. And that's really what they're explaining in the set length method. They break it down on the bottom of the page here, all right, in your book on the bottom of the page, and they go through all the major components. They say that header has got the word public. That's called an access specifier, and it means it can be called from other classes because it's public. It's got void, so it means it doesn't return anything. Set length is the name of the method, of the um, method rather, and the double u, the double len is what the parameter is that's passed into it. Now you might say, well, 
I sort of get that. That's where you should be right now. If it totally made sense and you could do this by yourselves, then what the heck are you doing in here? All right? But I will tell you that if we go through the whole chapter and you still have questions, you're going to have to take the time to go back and page through it. There's no way to give, you know, in, in, in two hours worth of time to go over everything that's in all 50 to 60 pages here and do it in, in, in length and breadth of coverage. If you want more than on the next page here, so again, in your book on 136, they show you this. So they break down exactly all the different components in there and what they are. All right. So I've gotten to that point. Now, let's pretend for a second that the only thing that I put in here right now were these, were the, the uh, get and the set for length. So let's, for right now, let's just pretend we don't even have these in there. All right? So the author says next, he wants you to come in here, do a new. He wants you to do not a new project, but we want to put in a new class in our rectangle. And we're going to call this rectangle demo. Oops, that was pretty neat. All right, so rectangle demo. And we do want this one to have a main. So we're going to click Finish. And now we've got another thing in here. So we've got Rectangle and Rectangle Demo. All right? So what he says is, let's come in here. And in main, we're going to say Rectangle Box equals New Rectangle. That's actually calling a method that we haven't created yet. And you say, well, why doesn't it give you an error then? Because if we don't create that method, the system creates it for us. You'll see this in a minute. Okay? So I'm going to say here, this is the exact stuff that you see in your book on the bottom of page 136. System.out.println sending the value 10.0 to... the set length method. Box dot set length. And see how the IntelliSense knows it's there already? So I can double click on it. And now we've got to put the number in there. So 10.0. All right. Hopefully whatever is in there is I had it set for an int. Okay, so I'll come back here, and all these that I have in there is an int. I guess those should have been doubles. Let's do this. Now, notice how that went away. Okay. So, that's it. System dot out dot print line. They just, they want the word done in there. I don't know why, but they do. All right. This doesn't do very much the way it is right now. I'm going to save everything, and I'm going to come in and run this. And it says, sending the value of 10 to the set length method done. Okay, fine and dandy. But I want to show you in English what's happening here. When it hits this line of code, rectangle box equal new rectangle, what it does is it comes over here and it says, oh, there's nothing in here that I can see that's called rectangle. So it looks for the other file that's in here. All right? So it starts to come in here and it starts to look through here. So these two files are working in unison with each other. The file rectangle.java has got all my methods in it. The demo it's got my demo, so I can try out those methods. So when I come here and say box.setLength, looks and it says there's no set length in here, so it looks in here and says, is there a set length? Yes, there is. Did I pass a double into it? Yes, I did. 
So everything's cool. So it says take whatever I passed into that and set the value right there to 10. Okay. So these two pro these two files are working in unison with each other. They're part of the program. And that's what they're showing you. I went through it quickly, but that's what they're showing you there on the bottom of 136 and the explanation on 137 and 138. Now, as you probably guess, okay, if I went back to my demo, and I'm just literally going to grab this stuff right here. Same stuff we had before. And I'm going to paste it in again. You go, why, why would you do that? You'll see why in just a second. All right. So there's my, I'm setting the length. Now I want to set, send the value of, let's make it 15, just so we got a different number in there, to the set width method. All right. And this will be width. And that'll be 15. So notice if I save again and run it again, now it's done both of those. So what I did was what I've done inside of my demo, this right here, that's called instantiating or creating an object. I'm, I'm using the rectangle class to create an object that's called box. And then now that I've created it, now I can call the methods of the rectangle class, including set length and set width. All right. And that gets us in our book to page 139. All right. Now, what if I want in here, instead of having it say done, I want the system to tell me what those, what those are. I want, it, I want the system, instead of saying done, I want it to tell me what the, what the uh, length is and tell me what the width is. Does that make sense? All right, so I'm going to say in here the length is, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it literally to call get length. All right, and then I'm going to say, I'm going to run out of room here, so. The width is, oops, all right, so I've called get length and I've called get width. Now, what doesn't it like? Oh, I've got to say box dot get length and box dot get width, all right? So I want to make sure I put this all on the screen so everybody can see all of it and box dot get width. So if this worked, and we'll see it right now, now we sent them to get to set length and set width, and now we can see with our calls to get, they indeed have been set. This is how you write Java code. I mean, it's very simplistic, but this is how you do it. All right. Again, all I'm doing is very quickly going over the same stuff that's in the book. And on, in the code listing 3.5 on pages 142 and 143, that's where they show. All right, that, that's where they show exactly what's going on. So the only thing that we haven't done yet is that area function. So in other words, we've done a set and a get on our length. We've done a set and a get on our width. And now we've got to do area. Now. This one looks a little weird, and it is, but I want to try to explain this. So if, if it doesn't make sense, please, please tell me. All right. Normally when you do a get, normally when you do a get like this, you're asking somebody for information. You're not changing anything. All right. So you might say, well, yeah, but you're doing a calculation here. Why didn't you have a set area? And we could have done that. But what we want to make sure is every time we call get on the area, we get what's called fresh data. Right? We don't want stale data. So if, if we go in here, let's say that we had run the program and we did all this stuff, and then we call get area. All right? And so let in fact, I'll do it for you. So the length is, the width is, the area is, 
and we'll make a call to get area. All right. So again, uh, box dot get area. I'm sorry. All right. Now, if everything worked. Okay, does that make sense to everyone, what we just did? All right. Now, I want to show you why it's being written this way. Okay, so again, we could have a get area and a set area. All right, now I'm going to come back in and I'm going to make changes. And I'm going to say here, box dot set width 12.0, box dot get width, I'm sorry, set height, uh, length 12.0 and then I'm going to just grab all that stuff that's in here and do it again okay so I'm going to run it a second time Ten, fifteen, ten, fifteen, 150 12 12 144 it worked all right but if all we had was a get area, so let's say that in our get get area that we have right here, let's say that instead in our get area, instead of doing this, all we did, I'm going to comment this out for right now. Let's say that all we did was we returned the area. First of all, we'd have to come in there and we'd have to create another variable over here called area. We'd have to do that because that's why we're getting the underline here. So let's even say we did that, all right? If we make a call to get area and we forget to call set area first, we're going to be giving back wrong data. So in order to eliminate what's typically referred to as stale data, all right, you do the calculation in your get routine. And you can see that it all worked. So they've, they've got the whole class in here on pages 144 and 145. And then the whole demo on the bottom of 145 and then on 146. And then on 146, on the bottom of the page, they talk about data hiding. And really with data hiding, the idea is if since these methods are all public, all right, since these methods are all public, if I give, if I give my code let Luke use my code and all I tell him is hey if you can call set with and you got to pass in a double he doesn't know how that's being done and if I confused you think about it this way because I've used this example before all right there's a calculator I type in 341 and I hit square root and I'm asking this not not to be funny does anybody know exactly internally in the calculator what happened to make that come out because I don't have a clue it's been abstracted or hidden from me that's how we live a lot of our lives. You do things, and you learn on a, on a peripheral type of level what you have to do, and that's what you do. All right. So all I know is I put in a number, and I click that button, and it gives me what I want. And if you've got a class that you're using in Java, whether you wrote it or someone else wrote it, and it's public, all you have to do is agree to use it the way it's supposed to be used without knowing how it works. The only ones you really have to understand how they work are, are the ones that you write. And what's really nice, too, is if let's say that tomorrow somebody comes in and they create a brand new way to do square roots. All right. And now when I press this, even though it came like that, it comes 10 times faster. All right. If that, if that code is hidden from me, as long as my interface looks the same, they can make any changes they want to. What you see is what's referred to as the interface. All right, that's your interface to it. The actual code that's making it happen behind the scenes, that's referred to as the implementation. So I can jack with the implementation all I want as long as I don't change the interface. And that stuff is done in code all the time. All right. If you want more on the stale data, you can look in the book on 147. And then they go in and they talk more and more and more, et cetera, about, about uh, the, the, the UML stuff. Again, we're, we're never going to be able to get through the chapter if we, if we keep talking about that stuff. So It's not that it's not important. You won't be tested on it because we don't have tests. 
but I mean, it's, it's something that would be worth your while to know. It's, there is a chance that, that you could go for a job interview at some time and be asked about UML. What experience do you have with UML? Or they'd give you a diagram like this, and you should know that's the name of the class, that's the name of my data, that's the data types, the minus means that it's private, the plus means that it's public. All right. This means that it expects one parameter that's a double, one that's a double, no parameters, no parameters, no parameters, returns a double, returns a double, returns a double, returns nothing, returns nothing. All right. So if you understand that, and if you say, well, I would if you wouldn't went over it so flippin' fast, just go out to uml.org, all right, because they've got a whole bunch of stuff out there. The next example that he has here you don't even have in your books. So let's just take a look at what's in the book. And I'm on the bottom of page 149. More about passing arguments. What I want to show you is what was in what we went over the other day in class. And that is, I think everybody understands data. I think everybody can at least understand what's going on in here. But when I created this line right there, all right, that line that said rectangle box equal new rectangle, what happened was Java went out and looked for something like this. It looked for a thing called rectangle that took no parameters, nothing. It didn't find it, so it wrote it. And actually, it writes it and it makes it look like this. That's a no arg parameter. It wrote that for me. Even though it, you know, I didn't have it, it wrote it because otherwise the program wouldn't run. All right. But notice if I come in here, and I just want to show you this, okay, I think everybody would agree that when we call this, when we ran this demo, we came in and we called set length and we called set width. What if we don't want to do that? In other words, what if I want to do this? OK, I'm going to leave that one the way it is. And I'm not going to do anything there. But I'm going to write another one. All right, in this one, I'm going to pass in a double that's called W and a double uh, double that's double that's called L. OK, and I'm going to say this dot width equals W, this dot length equals L. Okay? You might say, I, I don't understand what you've done. You will in a sec, hopefully. Now I can come in here and I can create a second box. So I'm going to create box 2. And this time I'm going to pass in a width, let's just say 30, and a height, 40. Okay? So now it's going to go out and look for a constructor that has two different things passed to it. So I'm going to grab everything that I have here as far as all this stuff, in fact, the one that I, where I reset it here, I'm just going to get rid of that. And we'll use this one. So this will be box 2 length, box 2 width, and box 2 area. All right. Notice I got, I've got no errors. And when I run this, hopefully I'm going to get 10, 15, and 150, and then 30, 40, and 1,200 if this worked correctly. If it didn't, you'll know it right when I know it. And there it is. So what I was trying to show you right there, and it's a very important concept that you understand this. We'll get, we'll get into it more as we go on in here. But we've created two different constructors. One that's called, literally, this is referred to as a no arg constructor which means there's nothing inside of the parentheses. There are no arguments. Here, it's requiring two arguments. If I try to create another box here, you answer this question for me. This is going to fail. Can somebody tell me why that's going to fail? Right, because it's looking for something either with none or with two, and it finds one with one. So it doesn't know how to handle it. It says, do you want to add an argument? 
So it's going to try to fix it, but it, what it does is it comes over here and it looks, says there's one with no arguments, there's one with two arguments, and there aren't any more. There isn't one with one argument. That's why you get the error. So we could write another one, but we're not told to do that here. So I'm not going to. All right. Think about it this way, because sometimes this helps for people. Let's assume that I'm asking you to pass in, I'm, I'm asking you to write a routine. And you're going to create a class. We, and we, could, well, we could do this, but I'm not going to write all this. Where either you pass in nothing, or you pass in just your first name, or you pass in your first name and your last name, or you pass in your first name, your middle name, and your last name. Everybody with me? So if you pass in nothing, it's going to set your first name, your middle name, and your last name to the empty string. Or I could set it to null or unknown if I wanted to. If you pass the first name in, it'll set the first name, and it'll set the other two to unknown or null or whatever. If I say the first name and the last name, those will be set and the middle name won't be set. Only if I pass in all three of those, all right, only if I pass in all three of those will it immediately set the first name, the middle name, and the last name for me. Right. Yes? The question was, do your constructors have to always pass what you're passing into them? And I would flip the question around and say, you have to always write the constructor first and then write on your demo to test. Now, if, if you remember the, the, the employee program that we did last time, there were three constructors. One where you passed in nothing, and you set a couple of three of those fields to the empty string and one to zero. One where we passed in two things, and we set those two, and the other ones that we passed, we set to the empty string, and one where we passed in all four. So that's why when I called them in the demo, we called it three different ways. So you had a chance to have all three constructors. All right. I don't, hopefully I'm answering your question. So they talk next about passing arguments. Right here, this should make sense to you. This should make sense to everyone. We're passing in no arguments. Here, we're passing in two arguments. These arguments that we pass in right here, those two, must match in the data type, must match those two. You can raise your hand and go, wait a minute, they don't. Those are ints. The system automatically appends a point zero on here, or we could have done that ourselves. All right, and it will still work the same way. Now, if I try doing this, I'm going to grab that one up for just a second and remove it. Notice I get an error because I'm trying to pass a string and a double, and in my constructors, I've got nothing or a double-double. So I can't do that. So it's always looking to match up and map up what you've done with what's out there. This is the test code. This doesn't matter. That's the real code. All right. Now, when you pass these values in, I may have told you this before, but I'm going to say it again. You'll probably see me do this more than once in the semester. All right. Write eight lines, lines up here. Those eight things that you see on the screen right now, those eight, byte, short, int, long, float, double, char, and boolean, those are what are referred to as the eight primitive data types in Java. That means they're simple data types. Some books call them atomic. What that means is if I pass in a byte or a short or an int or a long or a float or a double or a char or a boolean like we're doing here, it passes them by value, so it makes a copy. In essence, when I call this, just so you know, when I call this one right here, it's making a copy of the 30. It's not the real 30. It makes a copy of it. All right? And it makes a copy of that. So the pass by value stuff is on the bottom of 151. 152, they show you that's the room area one, I guess. And I'm just going to skip that one for now. But you should be able to take a look at the program code listing 3.9 that's on pages 151 and 152. 
you should be able to take a look at that and figure out what's happening. It's really not really very different from what we just looked at. Turning up to 155, they talk about constructors. I've just kind of beat constructors to death with it. Right? So everything you see on 155, and it goes all the way through, all right, all the way through the bottom of page 160. We've now gone over. I do want to mention something to you, and this is mentioned on the bottom part of page 60, just so you see this. Okay? Strings in Java are kind of, uh, kind of I'm going to say this, you might laugh, it's not meant to be funny, but um, those eight data types I just showed you are primitive. What we'll talk about later are what, when we get to arrays and things like that, those are known as objects. Strings are kind of a, a, a data type in purgatory. They're not really simple, they're not really complex. And the reason I'm telling you that is I want to show you this. I can do this. String. All right. And that'll work. There's not a problem at all doing that. But I can also write it like this. I'll call it first name two so I don't get an error. Because really, strings are more of an object than they are a primitive data type. So when I create them, I can create them like you'd create a primitive, or I can create them the way that you create an object. And that's why I say they're sort of in purgatory, because you could do it either way. If you do this, the system basically goes and does that for you, Okay, just so you're aware of that. And they start to explain it now. It's on the bottom of page, on the bottom of page one. 60 and uh, to the middle part of page 161. All right. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to spend five minutes here giving you an introduction to this bank account class that they have on pages 161 and 162, and then we'll look at it as a class after the break. All right. I don't need these anymore. Again, I want to make sure that I'm saying this again so everybody hears this. If you do look, you don't have to go out there, but if you look up on the screen here, you know the, the drill by now, the way I do this. If I go out to 143 for the spring, all that source code in the book is in there. So if you want the code for Chapter 3, there's the rectangle, done in phases. All right? And we're going to go over bankaccount.java after the break. So all these things that are there, they're all in there. So we will look at them after the break. And rather than having to write those, I'm going to literally steal those two and copy them and work with those after the break. I'll, I'll get that stuff ready when we break. But before we do, I want to talk about this bank account class that they mentioned on pages 161 and 162. All right. Now, where will it be in here? I have no idea. See, he puts a lot of stuff, and then he changes his books around all the time. That's why I was really hoping that he would have had this in a PDF or some other kind of uh, way that he doesn't have right now. So let's just look at what's in the book. So I'm in section 3.5 on the middle of page 161. It says, the rectangle class discussed in the previous section allows you to create objects that describe rectangles. Now we will create an object that allows you to, to create a bank account. All right. So notice that a bank account has the name of the the uh, the name of the class will be bank account. It has three data members in it. It's got a data member that's a double called balance, which is of course your current balance. It's got a data type called interest rate, which has got the current interest rate, and one called interest. That's also a double. It also has one, two, three, four, five, six different methods. The first method, as you can see right there, is the constructor. So it's assuming that you're passing in a starting balance and an interest rate. Okay, but no interest, because you, if you're just starting, you haven't earned any interest yet. So that'll be, you'll probably set that to zero. You've got a deposit where you pass in an amount and it returns nothing. You've got a withdrawal 
that you pass in a double and it returns nothing. You've got an add interest where you pass in nothing and it returns nothing. You've got a get balance that returns a double and pa nothing passed in, and a get interest that returns a double and has nothing passed in. And that's the summary that's on the bottom of page 161, and it goes up to page 162. All right. So if we look real quick, what you end up seeing, and we're going to go over all the code after the break, but if you look quickly at the code that's here on mainly the stuff on 163 in your book, notice how small those methods are. Many of them have one or two lines of code, and that's it. That's object-oriented programming the way it should be written. Many methods that are very small and do one distinct thing, all right, and do it well. All right, so we're going to take a break, and after we get done with the break, we're going to bring up the bank account and the account test and go over those. Then there's some cell phone example that I'm not going to cover. And then they, they've got just a few other things that they talk about, and that'll finish us up. All right, so it's 10.50. Let's please come back at 5 after 11.